been true. Every NFL team right now believes they have their quarterback for the future. Now, a couple of them, like the New York Giants, I think are bluffing, and they know they have to draft a quarterback. What's going to be really interesting for the rest of the season, watch Oregon's quarterback, Justin Herbert. Six, five and a half, 220, can run big arm. He's going to be the number one pick. Don't listen to these mock draft people. It's like Ben Simmons. I don't care if he can't shoot. Ben Simmons is the best college player. I don't care if he didn't go to the tournament. Justin Herbert is going to be the number one pick in the draft. And for the first time in my life, every NFL team is telling you the bad ones all have quarterbacks. And there's only a couple of teams. I think a couple of teams are bluffing that they really want quarterbacks, but they're not advertising it. And I think one of them is the New York Giants. So watch Oregon football on a Saturday if you get a chance, because this Justin Herbert kid, he's got some Patrick Mahomes. Big arm, can run around, is mobile, and, I mean, it, you just watch him. You're like, in today's NFL, with all the rule changes, he'll walk in and play and be really good, really fast. So somebody's bluffing. Somebody's telling you they like their quarterback. Jerry Jones this morning was like, oh, I love Dak. We'll see. We'll see if they end up 6-10. and 10. With that, senior NFL reporter, lead content strategist at the Monday Morning Quarterback via the Coward Global Satellite Network, Albert Breer. Okay, so Julian Edelman's back. Does it solve the Patriots' problems? I don't think it solves all of their problems. They still have some issues on defense, but offensively I think it's huge for them because they've struggled some on third down. They've struggled in critical spots, and that's the guy that Tom Brady goes to. And if you really want to look at it historically, this may be the worst they've had at the slot receiver position over the last four games in Tom Brady's time in New England. They went from Troy Brown to Wes Welker to over the last five years, a combination of Julian Edelman and Danny Amendola. They've had almost nothing there over the first four weeks of the season, which I think goes a long way to explaining some of the ups and downs that Tom Brady's had. Julian Edelman comes back in, jumps into that slot position. Now, it's it's a short week, so it might not be right away. But he'll come back into that slot position, which is very, very important to the way Tom Brady plays football. And I think he'll make a huge difference, particularly in those tight spots and on third down. By the way, Dorsett had a great catch. You can't depend on him for nine a week, but he had a great catch. Corderell Patterson had a touchdown. Again, not a guy I trust for big games. Josh Gordon has had some, you know, he's had some personal issues, some drug addiction stuff. What's going on with Brady and Josh Gordon? Will it work? Well, they're, they're working on getting him into football shape now, and, and that, that's been a little bit of a process. It's part of the reason why Cleveland was frustrated with him. Um, I, I know that they put his locker next to Tom Brady's locker, which is something they've done in the past with players. They really want to become invested in the program. Randy Moss, once upon a time, his locker was right next to Tom Brady's. And so they're doing things to try and make it work. And what's unique about this situation, Colin, if you look at the way that the Detroit Lions attacked the, the, the New England Patriots, They forced Tom Brady to throw it down the field and outside the numbers. And Brady has struggled in the past at times in that spot. The Browns, when they had Gordon in the building, kind of viewed him as like a luxury item. They felt like he'd let them down too many times and hadn't been dependable. So going into 2018, they wanted to build a team where where Josh Gordon would kind of be the icing on the cake. And that's why they, they go out and they get Jarvis Landry and they bring in Antonio Callaway. And... Now he goes to New England, and he's he's not a luxury item there. They really need him to play well. Yeah. So to that end, I think that they've really they, they've really done what they, they, they've done what they needed to do to try to get him back on track. Now, we over the years we've seen he's not very dependable, and this thing could go off the rails at any time. But they, at least you see from the Patriots now, this isn't just something where they're you know, throwing him in the ocean and seeing if he can swim. They're actually giving him some support. We'll see if it works out. Patrick Mahomes is remarkable. Mitch Trubisky threw for six touchdowns. The NBA figured this out a few years ago. Open up the offenses. <laughs> Don't allow hand checking. Don't allow yeah. bigs to put their elbows in people's backs. And the NBA ratings are up. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm watching these games. When Mitch Trubisky throws for six uh, yep. We got a different league. Um, I mean, th- th- this is paying off, right? This is what the league wanted, right? I mean, and I think part of this is enter- part part of this is the rules, like you mentioned, and this goes back like twelve or thirteen years. You want to go all the way back to when they changed the rules as to what corners can do to receivers coming off the line. Obviously, the the rules now, um, when it comes to, to to contact on receivers, contact on quarterbacks, and all of that helps offense. But I think as big a factor as anything, Colin, is that coaches now more so than any time in the history of the NFL, are open-minded about what they're doing with uh, with offense, and they're more willing to adopt concepts that you see in high school and you see in college. Now, Chip Kelly was at the front end of this five years ago. 
now you're seeing everybody adopt these sorts of things. Matt Nagy in Chicago is a good example of it. Andy Reid, who's been a head coach for 20 years in the league, he's been very open-minded to it. Doug Peterson, of course, in Philadelphia. Sean McVay doing a lot of things that Cal did to try and make Jared Goff comfortable. We see how that's working out. And New England was doing this stuff six or seven years ago. They were starting to adopt some of the things you see in college. And so I think as much as anything else, as much as even the rules changes, one thing that's really changed the way offense is played is this open-mindedness on the part of the coaches. And I think you've heard the same thing as I have. Ten years ago, a lot of a lot of NFL coaches would look at that stuff and say, oh, that's college stuff. That could never work in the NFL. Well, you know, now you're seeing coaches are very open-minded to putting that sort of stuff in. It helps them adapt players quicker to the NFL because those guys coming from college are used to running those sorts of things. And we're seeing now schematically that that stuff does actually work at the NFL level. Since 1969, the Steelers have had three coaches. And Bill Cowher and Mike Tomlin have taken heat in their prime for losing some games they should have won. Yep. And, and so if you want to play, if you want to play, let's, let's see who's more patient with the Steelers. You're going to lose. Uh, they'll, they, they have a history of just sitting it out and trusting their game plan. You know, Lavian Bell is testing them in the, in, in the patience game. What do you yep. think happens? There's a report today. He's back in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, I think that part of this was, was sort of a, a try, an attempt to create some leverage on Le'Veon Bell's camp's part in that, like, this could force an answer out of the Steelers. In, in essence, he's saying, I'm going to show up during the bye week. I'm going to take a paycheck that week for not playing in a game. I'm going to save my body. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to play nine games for you. And – in the process, I can make it really awkward. You know, your, your team's teetering right now, and, and, and we'll see where the locker room is. But I'm going to show up, and you know what? Things might be a little awkward, and that's not of my concern because I'm going to be gone three months after that. You know, and so I, I think in a certain way, if the Steelers do intend to move Le'Veon Bell, Bell in this case is trying to, to get them to accelerate the process a little bit so he can get a little bit more of his money. We'll see whether or not that works. I personally think that they're equipped to deal with this sort of thing. I think we talked about this last week or two weeks ago, Colin, that that program's always been equipped to deal with big personalities, to bring in guys who've got checkered pass, to meld all of those things together. But I, I think this is an attempt right now on Bell's part, maybe he's getting a little antsy, to try to create some urgency on the Steelers' side so they've got to make a decision on what they're going to do going forward. You know, it's interesting. I was just thinking about this Albert Breer joining us, Monday morning quarterback, that Mahomes, uh, Goff, even Baker Mayfield, these young guys, Blake Bortles is doing well, Andy Dalton, that clearly mm -hmm. the rules are making it easier for quarterbacks, Mitch Trubisky, to come in this league and excel. And yep. while this is happening, Dak Prescott is eroding in front of our eyes. And I think Dallas, I said this before you came on, I don't remember a time in my life where every team either believes they have their guy or they're telling you we've got our guy. Now, I think, I think the Giants, if they go to 6-10, and 10, are going to have to make a tough decision. They're going to have to go after a quarterback. Right. And there's that kid at Oregon, Justin Herbert, who looks incredibly special. Yeah. And again, it used to be, Albert, about 50% of first-round quarterbacks flopped. That is not the case right now. Most of them are working. I mean, Josh Allen even has his moments. Yep. I, I think, you know, Jerry Jones said this morning on his radio show, oh, he is so special. I don't know, Albert. Six and ten, you can't win Super Bowls led by a running back. Do you believe the Cowboys are totally in on Dak Prescott? Well, I'm going to give you an interesting statistic here when it comes to quarterback investment, okay? Every team in the NFL either has a, a quarterback that they spent a first-round pick on or they're spending more than $16 million per year on except one. You know who the one is? <laughs> the one's, one's the Dallas Cowboys who have a fourth-round pick, a former fourth-round pick starting a quarterback. Look, I, I've talked to people in that building. They do believe that Dak Prescott can, can bounce back off of this. I think what's hard about it right now is that he's being held back in certain ways. A, the identity of that team has always run through that offensive line. Last week, they were pretty good. They hadn't been good the three weeks before that. The tight end and receiver situation, it is what it is. They've got some scheme issues, I think. They're not, being, they're not as innovative as some other teams have been on the offensive side of the ball. And so I think in certain ways, it's hard to get a full read on who Dak Prescott is right now just because of the environment around him. And that puts the Cowboys in a very difficult position because 2019 is a contract year for yep, Dak Prescott. Yep. You'd like to take care of him after this year if you can, or at least make a decision on him after this, this year if you can. And I'm not positive they're going to be able to get a clear enough read on where they are with Dak Prescott by the end of this year. 
to make a decision on whether or not they want to invest $30 million per year in the guy. Well said. Uh, Monday morning quarterback, lead content guy, uh, Albert Breer, our friend. Great stuff, Albert. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, it, um, it, it's really interesting. There, And I'll talk about this later, but usually in the NFL, there's like four teams. We all know we're going to draft quarterbacks. Well, the teams that are going to end up in the top ten, they've all got their quarterbacks. So it's going to be Dallas and New York, one of these teams. Giants defense is still playing well. And, you know, the Cowboys are 2-2. Two and two. But those two teams tell you they love Eli and Dak. There's no way Justin Herbert is not going number one. Because just look at the numbers, folks. What's happening in the NFL is very clear. It used to be, not long ago, 